Welcome to the History of Witchcraft. Episode 40. The Pilgrims. Welcome back to the History of Witchcraft. Last time we finished our triad of standalone episodes covering pagan and early Christian Byzantium, England, and the Frankish Empire. It's quite odd, and a sign of the changed focus of the show, that I consider standalone episodes to be noteworthy. After all, it's almost a year since we last had single episodes devoted to a particular time and place. From November to September, we were, in one form or another, in early modern Britain. It was actually quite a change for me to look up at my bookshelves and realise I had to actually update my research. Some of them had been on loan from the library for a year. This week, after our hiatus to the medieval world, we return to the early modern, and with a brand new England to explore. Ha ha, I am a master of wordplay. New England, the cluster of colonies on the eastern coast of North America. Now, despite the moniker, New England shared many of the traits of the old, as we shall soon see. European settlement in the New World had been dominated for over a century by the Spanish and Portuguese before the English began to take a serious interest in North American colonisation. There had been previous attempts during the Tudors at Newfoundland and Roanoke, or Roanoke, I'm not quite sure, which had failed for a variety of reasons. English attempts at colonisation in this period were motivated by a variety of causes. Commercial success for investors into their country, religious conversion of the indigenous peoples, strategic dominance at sea and on land. While France would be England's, and eventually Britain's, famous rival in the colonial sphere, it was Habsburg Spain that attracted the most attention from early English advocates of colonisation. Rivalry with the Spanish, who had laid claim and ruled over vast tracts of the New World and the Old, satisfied all three of these motivations. Spain's treasure fleets were famous across Europe for the fabulous wealth they brought across the Atlantic in gold, silver, and spices. If England could establish a presence in the New World, the English could challenge this financial success. Spain was not only a rival in trade, but in religion as well. Zealously Catholic, Spain had spread the religion of the Pope across the globe, and the Protestant English were aghast by embracing the New World. Perhaps this papal expansion could be countered by the true faith. Both of these motivations went hand in hand with the third, strategic concerns. While the English had tried, multiple times, to attack and loot the Spanish treasure fleets and had, multiple times, failed to do so, this state-sanctioned piracy was not remotely unsuccessful. The port of Cadiz in Iberia had been raided, delaying the Spanish Armada by a year, but more importantly, for more commercially-minded parties in London, the Spanish colonies in the Caribbean were remarkably vulnerable to raids. A permanent presence in the Americas that allowed for English privateers to ply the seas for plunder would be incredibly valuable. Despite the accession of James, who was more interested in peace with Spain rather than war, these arguments for empire did not go away. England and Scotland had been largely successful in their first project of colonisation, that of Ireland, and had learned many lessons from the plantations. Likewise, privateering and the promise of easy loot from colonial raids had given the English plenty of battle and sea-hardened sailors, who were willing and able to travel to and from the New World like they were born to it. James kept clear of antagonising Spain too much, including going so far as executing Sir Walter Raleigh after an unauthorised raid on a Spanish outpost, and outright dissolving trade companies which had been establishing plantations along the Amazon and Weapoco rivers in South America. Despite these royal setbacks, the calls for colonies remained strong. In 1606, a group of Englishmen formed a joint stock company, with royal permission, to found a colony somewhere between the Potomac and Kennebec rivers on the North American continent. That is quite a range, somewhere around six to seven hundred miles. 
far enough away from Spanish interests, they settled, in both senses of the term, at a place called Sagadahoc in the modern state of Maine. Within a year, the colony and the company had been crippled by financial ruin and conflict with the local Native Americans. More successfully, but only just, another joint stock company, the Virginia Company, was granted a royal charter and a small but lasting beachhead on the North American continent was founded in 1607, Jamestown. The colony was firmly intended to be a commercial investment, and the revelation that tobacco was a profitable luxury gave Virginia its purpose. But it was not a simple success. There was mismanagement both in the colony and in London, vital supplies were in vitally short supply, violent conflict with local Indians, and, oh yeah, the majority of settlers died. Jumping forward, after almost a century of existence, after a century of births and the migration of 116,000 people, Virginia had a population of 90,000. A sizable number of people, no doubt, but the death toll was egregious. Gradually, though, the population grew until there was little chance of Virginia following the example of every other English colony. It still didn't make a profit, though, which was naturally a concern for its commercial backers, and eventually the Virginia Company would collapse in 1624. The colony they had established, however, did not die with them, and it became a royal colony. Virginia was just the first successful English colony, and in 1620, someone decided to give the 1606 attempt another go. I'm well aware that for the vast majority of my listeners, who hail from the United States, the tale of the Pilgrims and the Mayflower is old hat at this point. One of the founding myths of the country, a legendary series of events, of plucky Puritans seeking a new land to worship freely, who make the arduous journey across the Atlantic Ocean and land at Plymouth Rock. Here, they made successful contact with the Wampanoag people and held the first Thanksgiving, a tradition that continues today. That's the myth, but I think that it is worthwhile to return to the reason for the Pilgrim's Voyage. The colonies established in New England, as it would come to be known, were founded largely for religious motivations, although their London backers were keenly interested in its financial and strategic benefits too. As we touched on during our episodes on Matthew Hopkins and the Puritans in England, the Puritans were extremists who fundamentally disagreed with the toleration of the Church of England for what they saw as residual papist elements. The colonies established by these first settlers remained an attractive destination for the English godly, who lamented the further Laudian reforms under the Stuarts. Lord, Archbishop Lord that is, was accused of being an Arminian, Uh, Arminianism denied predestination, and the Puritans feared was the first step towards England returning to Catholicism. Adding to this spiritual concern, a financial crisis in the cloth trade gave many future settlers more earthly motivations to flee the old world. For the later foundation of Massachusetts Bay Colony, the apparent unwillingness of Charles to consider the political concerns of Parliament, including opposition to his religious reforms, further fueled desires to leave for the godly community being created in this new world. Anyway, back to the narrative. After the Pilgrims arrived and established Plymouth Colony, a decade later in 1630, their brothers in religious dissension established the Massachusetts Bay Colony. The settlers were aided by a few factors, namely the short-lived presence of the Sagadahoc Colony. This colony, despite only lasting a few years, had allowed the transmission of European diseases that the American Indians had no resistance to. In 1998, Professor Virginia Dejon Anderson estimated that between these two attempts, the 1606 and the 1620, quote, perhaps 90% of New England's natives died of such European diseases as smallpox, plague, and measles, against which they lacked adequate immune responses. Indians who survived the epidemics witnessed an unprecedented disruption to their way of life and struggled to understand the meaning of the sudden catastrophe. The colonists, by contrast, concluded that God had providentially cleared the land of its inhabitants to accommodate his chosen people, end quote. 
God must have been quite handy with an axe and hoe, since the land at Plymouth had also been cleared of trees. Before succumbing to the diseases, it appears that the Indians had felled the forest, and it had yet to return. As it was, the pilgrims met much the same fate, with nearly half dying to either pestilence or the elements before the year was out. The survivors, to their credit, did not give up easily, and persisted. They gradually built a community, trading with the Indians and shipping lumber and furs back to England to pay their creditors. John Carver, the chosen governor of this small colony, made his famous Treaty of Friendship with the Sachem of the Wampanoags, Massasoit, and they had possibly the most famous dinner in American history. Plymouth's reputation is much grander than its contemporary importance would suggest. When compared with Massachusetts Bay Colony, it was dwarfed by both population and economic importance. The two colonies would also differ politically, and religiously, despite both being founded and run by Puritans. While the Pilgrims considered the Church of England to be too far gone and worth splitting from, the colonists of Massachusetts Bay rejected this separatist cause. The Church could, and should, be reformed to a godlier standard. In this vein, Massachusetts Bay was able to advertise itself more strongly in Old England, As they weren't advocating for splitting the church, many prominent ministers of the colony would return to England in the 1640s, seeing the circumstances as ripe for further reformation. The MBC, that's Massachusetts Bay Colony to you and me, was formed in 1629, and recruited the prosperous Suffolk lawyer John Winthrop to lead the excursion in spring 1630. After a nine-week voyage, the seven vessels carrying 700 colonists arrived in Cape Ann Harbour, and were followed over the subsequent years by over a thousand new arrivals per year. Many of them were friends or acquaintances of our old friend Matthew Hopkins, who himself had almost joined John Winthrop's colony before circumstances intervened. One of the key differences of the MBC was in its charter. Every other trading company that had been granted a royal licence was made to have its headquarters in London. This allowed royal officials to keep an eye on these far-flung operations, even if distance meant they were fairly loose-handed. The MBC had no specific location for their headquarters, and so the governor of the company, and the general court of the company, held their meetings in the colony. Effectively, this allowed the administration to be completely autonomous from London. This did not translate to autocratic power for Winthrop, however, and he was immediately beholden to the general court, who would seize the authority to elect their governor and his deputy. The general court became a two-tier assembly, much like in England, and all freedmen who were members of the church were eligible to stand and to vote. This form of representative government was remarkably sturdy, surviving until the events at the end of the 17th century. Quite soon into the life of the colony, overcrowding became a source of complaint for the colonists. Largely pastoral, issues seemed to have been more to do with the population of animals rather than the population of people. In 1634, settlers left Massachusetts to found a number of towns in modern Connecticut, and the Massachusetts government insisted that it held jurisdiction over this diaspora, although the claim was foiled when a patent was granted for the Connecticut lands. During a war with the Pico tribe, the Massachusetts government asserted control over the smaller colony, only for its supplies and defence to be woefully mismanaged. The Connecticut settlers created their own general court, mirroring the legislature of Massachusetts, and after the war was won, with the massacre and domination of local Indians, they drew up a charter called the Fundamental Orders, which completed the system pioneered by their larger neighbour. These orders remained in force until 1662, when the newly restored King Charles II granted the colony a royal charter which confirmed these conditions. A year after the establishment of the Connecticut settlements, the separatist Roger Williams moved to Rhode Island. I say moved. It was more of an exile or flight. Williams had disputed many of the facets of the Massachusetts church and government, calling for the rejection of what he considered impure elements of the church, and disputing the right of the king to intervene in colonial matters. 
For this, he was charged with sedition and ordered to return to England for trial. He opted not to do so, however, and fled to start his own settlement, calling it Providence, and soon received further exiles from NBC. One of these was Anne Hutchinson, who would eventually move on to Long Island. Massachusetts Bay would continue to have problems with religious dissension, despite being founded by religious dissidents. Banishment was the usual punishment for being too radical for the magistrates, and death was the punishment for breaking this exile. The Quakers were one particular group that was not remotely welcome, and four were hanged in Boston between 1659 and 1661 for returning. Religious dissent could not be eliminated from New England entirely, of course. Even in Old England, the source of many of the radicals hadn't been able to manage that. And so the hostile environment of Massachusetts merely pushed the radicals away, further bolstering the populations of Rhode Island, New Hampshire, Nantucket, and of course, the small colony of Plymouth. Despite this rather rapid growth, New England was never a sure chance, and it survived not solely because of the tenacity of its colonists, nor the support of Puritans in England. By this point, England had managed to found a number of colonies along the eastern seaboard of North America, as well as in the Atlantic and the West Indies. In fact, Professor Nicholas Canney points to the growth and success of Barbados as a key factor in New England's survival. Barbados suddenly became a magnet for investment and workers, as the sugar crop took the markets by storm. Before this, Barbados had either produced tobacco or pirates, neither of which were particularly profitable. Piracy, for obvious reasons, and tobacco because of the higher quality and better value crops coming out of Virginia. Sugar suddenly made Barbados, and later the Leeward Islands and Jamaica, economically solvent, and settlers flooded to the islands. These settlers faced an even worse experience than the New Englanders or the Virginians. Professor Canny states that around 150,000 settlers had flocked to the West Indies. Only 20,000 white Europeans remained in 1689. Some of them undoubtedly left the islands for greener pastures or back home, but the tropical diseases laid waste to Europeans in vast numbers. Still, those settlers needed food, however long they remained, either in the Caribbean or alive, which they found in the agrarian and fishing communities of New England. Therefore, New England rapidly became highly involved in this imperial system that had sprouted amidst England's burgeoning empire. After the 1660 restoration, the colonists began to aggressively expand beyond their previous borders. The new generations, born and raised in America, wanted to set up their own farms and towns, and gradually they settled closer and closer to native communities. Initially, disputes between colonists and Indians were usually settled in the Indians' favour by the colonial governments, with colonists ordered to recompense natives out of fear for reprisals, aware of their tenuous position. There had been wars, of course, particularly the Pico War in the 1630s, which the English had won, but there was a significant disadvantage in numbers on the colonists' side, and every person lost to violence was one who couldn't grow crops, fish the seas, or raise children. However, after decades of continuous growth, the English began to realise that the balance of power had shifted in their favour, and increasingly the colonists forced natives to move on, or become dominated and second-class labourers and servants in the English colonies. By 1675, the Wampanoag tribe had had enough, and launched a series of raids on the Plymouth colony and its surrounding towns. Matacom, known to the English as King Philip, led the American Indians to war in retaliation for decades of abuse. This ballooned into a pan-tribal cause as the rest of the Algonquin people joined in to punish and drive back the interlopers. The Indians attacked more than half of New England's towns, destroying a dozen. Unable to defeat the Indian warriors on the field, the English soldiers targeted their food supplies, weakening the natives with hunger and opening them up to disease the ever-present weapon of the colonists. The English also approached the enemies of their enemies, the Mohawk, who stood to gain from assisting the Europeans and were willing to do so. 
1676, the Mohawk warriors attacked the Algonquin forces, further weakening Philip's army. Philip himself met his end at the barrel of a gun wielded by a Christian Indian, and the war was over. Then came the punishment. The majority of Philip's followers were either executed outright or enslaved. This retribution was not isolated to those who had fought against the English. Indian allies of the English were also caught up in this violence, and many fled to Canadian settlements or New York. Those that remained were isolated in their, quote, praying towns, end quote, settlements for Christianized Indians that were effectively reservations. To the New English, the war had been God's punishment for their sins, but their victory was his love giving them a chance for redemption. Membership of the church exploded after the war, and the Indian threat had been thoroughly neutralised, allowing for further expansion to the West. As Professor Anderson states, quote, The colonists also rejoiced that their victory had been achieved without help from England, interpreting this as an affirmation of their long-standing autonomy within the empire. Neither the king nor his councillors concurred, end quote. In 1676, during the war, the Privy Council had sent Edward Randolph to Boston to discover how the colony was faring and how well it was following the orders sent from London. He found a war-torn region where only lip service was paid to the Metropole. Randolph recommended to London that they take a firm hand with the colonies. Massachusetts was particularly resistant to London oversight, skirting tax requirements and otherwise ignoring the decisions of the English Parliament, particularly in matters of religion, and Anglican worship was still forbidden in the colony. In 1684, Massachusetts had its charter revoked by the Court of Chancery as punishment for acting too independently, and in 1685 the new King James II announced a plan to combine all of the New England colonies into a single entity, the Dominion of New England. Shock and horror followed, as the New Englanders were united only in their unwillingness to be united. The Dominion came into being in 1686, revoking all the colonial charters that had previously allowed for self-government in the colonies, and including the colonies of New York and New Jersey. The governor, Sir Edmund Andros, attempted to enforce legal and administrative changes in this enormous territory, and introduced the Church of England. It goes without saying that this was deeply unpopular. The Dominion did not long survive the Glorious Revolution, when James was deposed by his sister and brother-in-law, backed by a Dutch invasion. One of the most famous individuals in the tale of the Salem Witch Trials, Cotton Mather, was present for these events. Mather had been in London, meeting with the king to request certain liberties be returned to the former colonies. The meeting had gone well, and in October 1688, James had promised to address their concerns. Two months later, James was on the run from his sister and brother-in-law, and they took the throne as joint monarchs. Mather stuck around for these events, and petitioned William and Mary on the same subject he had approached James. Somehow, Mather convinced the Lords of Trade, the Privy Council body that had dispatched Randolph 12 years previously, to delay informing the Dominion officials of the revolution. During this delay, Mather wrote to his allies in the Dominion to incite the people against the officials, and in April of 1689, mobs rioted across the Dominion. Randolph and Governor Andros, along with other magistrates and officials of the Dominion, were arrested and imprisoned, and the former colonies declared their old rights and charters to be restored. The government, back in England, largely accepted this. So all well and good, then. Well, not quite. Our two protagonist colonies, Plymouth and Massachusetts Bay Colony, were in something of a bind. Plymouth had never had a royal charter, and so had no legal basis to govern themselves after the Dominion collapsed. Massachusetts had had its charter revoked quite some time prior to the Dominion, and so could not easily return to it. The joint monarchs were unwilling, despite the petitioning of Mather, to restore that charter, out of fears that it would result in a Puritan government, and so the Lords of Trade combined the two colonies into the single province of Massachusetts Bay in 1691, which included Nantucket, 
Martha's Vineyard, and parts of New York. The new colony became royal, with a governor appointed by the crown, and the franchise no longer restricted by membership of the church. So that is the history of Massachusetts up until the events at Salem. Sorry for the delay in this episode, it's been a very busy time for me. I'd love to say that regular episode releases will be returning soon, but I honestly can't be sure. The best way for you to keep up to date with the show is to follow me on Twitter, at Hist of Witch, or by liking the show's Facebook page. As always, thank you to my patrons. The Hammer of the Witches, executed today, Witchfinder General Michelle G, my Inquisitors Elaine D and Jean B, and all of my demonologists and theologians. They are all brilliant people, and you can join their ranks by going to patreon.com slash historyofwitchcraft. Besides supporting the podcast financially, please consider leaving a review on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Podchaser, or wherever you find good podcasts. I got my monthly update on iTunes reviews just the other day, and every positive review just makes my day. I read every single one, and I fully appreciate them, so thank you to those who have done it already. Next time, we will begin with the events at Salem, the most famous witch trial in American history. The intro and outro music have been provided by Sounds Like an Earful. Thank you again for listening.